can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sri Krishna Iyengar. Uh, I uh, teach here. Um, not taught much in the MA development except for an elective. Um, I'm here to introduce a friend of the university, uh, Mr. Narayan Ramachandran, um, who we know uh, in various ways, uh, and we're seeing, going to see, I guess, a new facet of him. Um, uh, briefly, Mr. Narayan Ramachandran uh, runs, is the chairman of uh, a company that seeds social ideas validated by research and driven by the spirit of entre entrepreneurship uh, to solve public problems in many ways. It's a company called Include Labs. Uh, before uh, he entered the social impact space, he was the lead portfolio manager of Morgan Stanley's global emerging markets and global asset allocation team, managing over $25 billion of assets um, spread over Singapore to New York. Um, we know Mr. Ramachandran as a person who plays a key and a very valuable role in the social impact space in Bangalore. Uh, he's contributed to many impact initiatives in, in Argyam as co-chairman of probably the largest uh, social capital funder called the Unitas Capital, uh, and with Jana Lakshmi Financial Services, which is a part of the Janagraha Group. He's also a director on the board of Ratnakar Bank. Uh, he's known for a phenomenal story uh, about uh, deworming more than 35 million school children uh, through a collaborative project with JPAL uh, and, and the Bihar Madhya Pradesh uh, governments. And apart from all this, he's also a, a columnist. Uh, he writes a column in The Mint called The Visible Hand on a variety of public issues, uh, ranging from uh, our political institutions like the Rajya Sabha uh, to, to politics and uh, also on sectors like housing and energy. Yeah. So that's a short introduction. Uh, so welcome, uh, Narayan, and uh, glad to have you here. Thank you. Hello. Is this on now? Yeah. So while uh, more people are trickling in, Before that, let me start by thanking uh, Professor Iyengar and Dr. Garda for inviting me here today. It's my privilege to speak about a topic that I have been speaking about for some time, but has become very relevant and uh, very contextual to the times we live in today. Uh, so hopefully we can deal with a lot of that uh, in, in Q&A. So uh, it is actually my pleasure to be here so that we can discuss not only the history of the topic that I'm uh, going to develop with you today, but also how it might apply to uh, almost television uh, level events. So thank you. Before I begin, uh, let me explain my attire. I, I realize it's not that different when I come to a university that I'm dressed like this, but trust me, when I go to my other corporate events, it does look a little out of context. Uh, and and the reason I'm dressed as I am is because a friend of mine who's a good speaker suggested that you should identify with your audience. So I said, okay, what's the best way with, by which I can identify fully with my audience, particularly given that I don't know the different groups of persuasion that my audience might have? So I said, okay, I'll wear a kurta. So that way I hope I will attract the JNU among you. Uh, to be, to be kindred, uh, of kindred spirit. Then I said I might as well wear a saffron kurta or as near saffron kurta as I can so that the Nagpur among you uh, would feel quite at home. Right? And then I'm carrying a jhola as you might, uh, and that's out of, I, I do it all the time, not specifically for this by the way, I find uh, uh, that it's, it's a good way to carry things around. So I'm carrying a jhola so the the, the true uh, Marxists among you will believe that I'm you know, doing the right thing. And then of course, uh, Professor Iyengar already said that I led a misguided youth on Wall Street and that I had already made a pact with the devil. 
So those closet capitalists among you will already feel like that I'm one of you anyway. So I hope I'm covering pretty much the entire audience uh, simply by, uh, by my profile. Uh, but the real reason why I'm wearing this is I'm on the board of Fab India and I find uh, woven cotton uh, absolutely the best for this hot weather that we have in Bangalore. So with that qualification, let me, let me start the topic. The topic, I don't know how many of you read the topic, you're probably just showing up here because it's one of the few air conditioned rooms at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But uh, we'll let you do that anyway. Uh, by the way, the other among you, I think, are wandering the malls, which are also air conditioned. But, uh, you know, we used to do that in the old days. I don't know, uh, the professors among you will remember. But there were, you know, public spaces in India were not air conditioned at all. So the only places that were air conditioned were a few multiplexes, very, very few. The PVRs of the world didn't exist then. So we, and you could go, particularly in Chennai, which was hot almost 100% of the time, you could go to these uh, movie theaters and you could buy a ticket that lasted the entire day. So you essentially go there, not watch a single movie and essentially go to sleep pretty much, right? So I presume some of you have come here to do that. So you're free to do that because the, the topic is going to get a bit heavy quite soon. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll excuse you that privilege. I don't know how many of the, what percentage of the halls is air conditioned? Not very many, right? Uh, okay, so I understand that. Hence the audience. So the topic itself is called um, liberal nationalism oxymoron, question mark. And even though it's being recorded, my fuller title was oxymoron, question mark, or oxygen for morons, question mark. Uh, but uh, I decided to keep the second part of it, at least out of the written text, though I presume I'm going to be captured on television and soon enough somebody's going to be after me for saying, you know, ins you're insulting morons by that comment. Um, let me begin, it's a relatively small audience, so rather than just me make this a one-way street, let me begin by just getting some ideas of what you think liberalism is. So anybody wants to volunteer a... Oh, sorry, the, egg, the first part of this where you're allowed to sleep and this one doesn't intersect too much. But anybody who's awake, you want to tell me what liberalism is? Matter. Basic is good. Uh, Allowing you and others to do what? What they want to do. Right? What they want to do. Okay, great definition. Okay, good start. Please. An idea that you can identify as liberalism through being no taxation. No taxation. No taxation. Wow, you must be a chartered accountant. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. You're free to do anything, and, and one of those freedoms is not to pay taxes, sure. Yes, please. Good one. Okay, one more and then I'll move to the second. Any, anybody else while we wait for some friends to join? Freedoms. Freedoms are very important to liberalism. So terrific. I think, you know, some context of what everyone, each one of you is saying is, is relevant to the, to the idea of liberalism. The, the, the word liberalism itself comes from the word libre, which means uh, freedom in Latin, as you all know. And and it's the same as liberty and other forms of the word lib, which essentially define uh, freedom in a variety of contexts, particularly uh, in, in the context of the, context of the individual. Um, brief moment, let's talk about nationalism. So can I pick on you since you volunteered to go first? Someone else? I mean, it's in, the, it's in the press every day. If nothing else, Arunam is shouting about it every evening. So you have to have some notion of la nationalism. Back there? Think about what it might Okay, coming, to, coming together of various citizens. Please. Okay. Okay. Last one, and then 
the way you connect to your nation or the identity of your nation, you identify yourself with. Okay. So, identity, commitment, uh, sorry, I don't quite remember what you said, but uh, anyway, the idea of togetherness to a particular call, I guess, is what the summary of what each one of you said. The word liberalism is much easier to define and accept in a certain boundary than the word nationalism. Uh, in today's English, the word nationalism is most often actually used in a pejorative way. Uh, the word nationalism typically means uh, a very bounded sense of nationalism, uh, maybe substitutable almost with uh, tribalism with a small t, not, not tribalism in the tribe sense, but tribalism in a small group sense. So if you, in a political science class anywhere in the world, use the word nationalism today, not always, but today it would tend to mean, you mean Zionism or Nazism or fascism or Judaism, you know, very specific versions of identity-based togetherness. The real word I think we are all after that represents the ideas that some of you identified and must actually represent the debate that we are having in India is patriotism, not so much nationalism. As I said, the word nationalism is actually far more parochial and often used in a pejorative sense. But for the rest of this talk, let's just assume that they are one word, though in both development, education, and, and the political policy kind of discourse, I would encourage you to be rather precise about the use of the word and use patriotism when, when you wish to describe uh, sort of a responsibility-based uh, membership uh, in a particular group uh, that most often defines, uh, let's say, a nation state, yeah? So let me just read to you very quickly uh, some thoughts from others on nationalism, and we'll get back to liberalism, which will form the substantial uh, portion of this conversation. But let me just uh, begin. Um, you know, George Will, the, the, the U.S. conservative commentator, describes nationalism as a necessary but not sufficient condition to defend liberalism in the country. And big brother George Orwell wrote an essay about the difference between nationalism and patriotism and con concludes that patriotism is a positive looking forward force. So distinguish patriotism from nationalism as sort of a forward looking force, a force that brings people together a force that has both not only rights, which is embedded in sort of a liberal philosophy, but also responsibility towards the state. Um, you might also think of, of, of nationalism as a patriot is proud of what his country does. A, a nationalist, is, nationalist is proud no matter what his country does. Right. So, just to clarify the semantic uh, quite a bit, that's, that's exactly where we stand. But for the rest of this conversation, let's just think about patriotism and nationalism to mean quite the same thing. So before I go further, I know, how many engineers among you? Okay, we got three or four. So, so do you think nationalism and uh, liberalism are on the same axes? Or for the engineers, do you think they might be an orthogonal axis? For the non-engineers, that means that way. Any, any thoughts? So the more liberal you are, the less national you're likely to be. That would be the proposition if you're all on a straight line. Whereas if you are this way, you could say you could be liberal and national, right? And you can think of it as an ordinate one and one as sort of the maximum on both counts, if you will. 100% on this and 100% on that, uh, so that would be. So, any any thoughts on this or this? Or oh, you think it's flat? Okay. The engineers? Oh. Engineers don't think about anything other than engineering. Okay. I think it's a, I would say orthogonal. Okay, orthogonal. So we got one of each. Okay. Any 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 other? So anyway, I'm hoping to persuade you that they're not like this that if you're liberal, you can be patriotic. Uh, and if you're patriotic, you can certainly be liberal or illiberal, it doesn't matter. Uh, so they're actually like this. And you can 
and as we go through the conversations, you can sort of make up your mind when I speak about various individuals, whether they are one or both, where they stay on that axis, uh, two axes, and what ordinal points you might give uh, to, to each of these. Now, if I asked you, where do you think liberalism started? And I'm not going to ask you that because it will take me a few minutes. So let me just ask it as a rhetorical question. I think most of you will say liberalism started in Europe some time ago, without being too precise about when it is. Uh, and if you were to locate that, it would probably be somewhere in the mid-17th to mid-18th century kind of zone, which many of us today call in Europe the Age of Enlightenment. And in the Age of Enlightenment, there was lots of things going on. As you know, there was both the uh, Renaissance going on, as well as a scientific revolution in its, in its background. And that set the scene pretty much for uh, European liberalism to, to sort of reawaken. And I'm going to explain the word reawaken in just a second. But for European liberalism to sort of, uh, the fellow who is considered to be the father of liberalism is a guy called John Locke. And John Locke essentially propounded that the idea of individual rights, the idea that man has certain natural and inalienable rights is the foundation upon which humankind should be based. Of course, there is a context to all this. The context is that until then, in the 13th, 14th, and 15th century, which somewhat appropriately called the Dark Ages, medieval period of European history anyway, the church was a major oppressor of society, uh, sometimes, but not always, in combination with the monarch. So the church and the state, in this case the church and the monarch, at different points in about a 300, 400, 500 period, starting from, say, 1100, 1200 AD till about 1600 AD, were oppressors of society. Uh, they, they did what they liked. Uh, they did not necessarily give individuals the freedoms that they might have demanded, even though at various times in history uh, there has been that, that demand for, uh, for individual freedom. So the context in which European uh, liberalism is set is a context in which the freedoms of man, and it was substantially man at that time, um, uh, were placed against the rule that was placed upon man by either the church or state. So that's the context in which uh, European liberalism is, is, is set. Many people who followed uh, uh, Locke and others, so fellows like uh, Voltaire and Rousseau and others, essentially built on this idea of people have liberty. This liberty is guaranteed by something that, and that particular guarantee is worth, valid against both the church and the state. Now, this idea was expanded to include the notion that not only is that liberty guaranteed by that, but in order to guarantee that liberty, you accept a certain amount of constitutional, governmental, democratic imposition. So, in effect, you're trading a bit of your right in order to guarantee the rest of your rights. And this particular aspect of it is called social contract theory. So that, as you know, some of you may know, is written by Hobbes. So you think of it as Locke and Hobbes together might form what you would call the foundations of classic liberalism, which is this idea that man has rights. These rights come from a natural place. This is this natural place of rights also protects these rights in the event that state or church would seek to superimpose upon those, those rights. So that is sort of the classical view of where uh, liberalism arose. But like ideas in humankind, and this is where I think the Saffron Rope guys are making such a bad mistake, uh, like ideas in humankind, these have been around forever. The word renaissance in European history itself means essentially a reawakening. It does not mean 
new stuff. It actually means a renewal. And in some contexts, the renewal of what was there in, uh, in sort of Greek philosophy, for instance. So uh, even that, therefore, trades back to at least maybe, let's call it 1,500 years before when it was rediscovered uh, in, in, in uh, Middle, Ages of, Middle Ages of Europe. But as it turns out, a concept of at least social contract theory, but perhaps even uh, some elements of liberalism was certainly pre present in many Buddhist teachings and might even be argued to be the basis of the Vedic philosophy of Purushartha. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. So just again to simply tell you that what we label so easily and what we go so easily against in today's world, okay, you know, this is a Western concept. This is, you know, brought to us from, from Fran the French Revolution and the American Revolution, and these ideas are therefore foreign and Western, is, is quite actually the opposite. It is at least Greek, which still is West of here, but it certainly could also be both in Indian and Chinese. I'm not going to deal with the Chinese part of this uh, for this conversation, but it's certainly possible that it was also discovered in a way in, in both uh, these ideas were at least expounded upon in both in antiquity in India and in, and in China. So let's just, for instance, all of uh, uh, a Buddhist text called Mahavastu, it has a lot about the Jataka tale. And all of you read various versions of the Jataka tales. If you actually read sort of the political and moral philosophies that are embedded in the Jataka tales, they actually, to me, form the basis of modern liberalism, perhaps far more than some of the other concepts that now we think form the basis, the foundations of that modern liberalism. Similarly, let's take the concept of Purushartha, which, uh, for those who may not know, is sort of this idea that the goal of life is, is sort of espoused in four ideas, dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. It takes a very spiritual context in, in this uh, rendition, but except for context, the idea is saying, uh, you might think of this version of both social contract theory and liberalism to do with an individual, but the idea of dharma in itself embeds the idea not only of how you will do righteous conduct, but how that righteous conduct will impact upon others, which in effect, if you use a 17th century label, would be social contract theory, right? So the rules of dharma, which are the, the rithas of dharma, are actually this idea of not only how I will keep myself, uh, the American word is centered to my true north, at the same time as how I will intersect with those around me. So suffice it to say that this notion of the age of enlightenment in, uh, in European liberalism is akin to uh, at least the social contract theory that is in Buddhism and the early uh, Vedic texts, uh, uh, texts of India. There are many, many other parallels. We will not have time to go through it at this, this time. For instance, even, even karma is widely misunderstood. Uh, most of us here relate to the idea of karma only through the book called Kama Sutra. But if you think about what Kama Sutra actually is, is exactly what happened in the European Renaissance under the Epicureans, under sort of the hedonists, uh, essentially celebrating the material and the aesthetic and the sensuous part of life rather than the spiritual, the, the religious, and the other parts of life. So it has actually got a very deep philosophical root that has only now been caricatured into, uh, into the books that you see. But if you look at each of them, Artha, in a certain sense of the term, is a very early exploration of what Adam Smith wrote in the theory of moral sentiment. So the context of these and the books in antiquity were really more, I would say, based on morality, personal morality in particular, and based on reason. The context of Western uh, European, in particular, liberalism is centered on the age of reason again. So the reason is common to both those 
ideas, but a reaction to the oppression of church and state. So these contexts are, are, are quite different, but the idea behind them, the idea that there are these natural rights, and these natural rights make us better citizens, better neighbors, and better members of a group, community, or society is, 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 is common, common to sort of, uh, common to both, both these things. Let me switch tacks and, 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 and sort of leap forward to what is probably best called 19th century Indian Renaissance. Uh, many of you probably know about the Bengali Renaissance of the late, late uh, uh, 18th century and the early 19th century. Probably started with, say, Raja Ramohan Roy and maybe ended with Tagore. Um, we can maybe aside have a debate of whether Tagore was both a liberal and a nationalist, but he certainly was liberal. Uh, and, and the Bengali Renaissance, again, both words are operative, it was mostly Bengalis, and it was about a reawakening of certain moral uh, and social mores that were being dealt with in the context of what was then a colonial, uh, colonially oppressed people. Most of you don't know, perhaps, that there was also a renaissance of sorts uh, centered in and around Pune. So the Bengali renaissance maybe traced its uh, part back to maybe, say, let's say, uh, I don't know, 7, 1850 to, uh, sorry, 1750 to 1910, something like that, or maybe 1780 to 1910, and, and the the uh, Pune, uh, Kolapur, Satara, that, that area, that revolution could probably be traced maybe 40, 50 years after that. So probably beginning in the 1820, 1830 period, ending again sort of 1910, 1920. And this was people, some of whom are long forgotten, a uh, guy called Ranade, for instance, Mahadev Govind Ranade. Uh, Gokhale was from this, uh, this school of uh, social reform. Uh, extremely liberal. Jyoti Raphule, is that somebody say Jyoti yeah, Raphule? Jyoti Raphule, certainly. Different context again. Uh, so each of these, I mean, for instance, Jyoti Raphule. Jyoti Raphule was a member in that time of a lower caste. So his version of social reform, by the way, one undercurrent of social reform through both the Bengali and the uh, Pune school was emancipation of women the uh, end of things like sati and so on. So that was very common. Uh, and the education of women. So in fact, Jyoti Raphule started the very first uh, school for girls uh, that was done by an Indian institution and is still, I think, uh, alive. The second school for girls was started by M.G. Ranade and his wife. Uh, so, uh, so I mean, really, sort of, I mean, or more than 150 years ago, uh, the idea of emancipation of women uh, by, by sort of this group of uh, Indian Renaissance players as, as a version of liberalism. And the, and the sort of the thread that comes there is that all of these folks essentially believed that both morally and socially, India needed to emancipate itself to a point where it was both eligible and worthy of independence. So today, again, you know, certain people in their tatkal opinion way easily dismiss uh, Gokhale, for instance, as a mere liberal, uh, as opposed to a very, very critical element of the foundation of eventual Indi Indian independence. Um, we can argue this, uh, but, but I do think actually that Firosha Mehta, Gokhale, Ranade, uh, even Dada Bhai Nauruji, who was actually an MP in the, in the United Kingdom, uh, all of whom, I, in my belief, were the people who laid the foundation stone for a nation, therefore nationalism and patriotism, even though they came from a persuasion that was significantly more uh, liberal. The two characters who you can debate greatly as to where they lay, lie on this ordinal axis of liberalism and nationalism are Gandhi and Tagore. And maybe we can take that in Q&A. Uh, but Gandhi had streaks of both, as, as you know. 
Uh, and Tagore opposed Gandhi whenever he showed a streak of non-reason. You know, for instance, Gandhi imposed upon others uh, this idea of fasting. And uh, Gandhi imposed on others various other what you might call eccentric uh, ideas, which Tagore was totally against saying, this, is, this has no basis in reason. For instance, the Charkha itself this is a you know, difficult thing to do. Why, why should I do this? It's easier for me to wear whatever I can and go join the freedom movement rather than sit spinning at home and I have absolutely no interest in this matter. So Gandhi and, and, and Tagore are complex characters. Let me just read you a quick um, couple of references on the, a uh, couple of I, things on these characters so you get a sense uh, about them. So my history of liberalism in contemporary India come, or, or in eight, 19th century India comes from the study of individuals. So let me just say what Nehru, who knew both Gandhi and Tagore, speaks about them, for instance. So he says, two types entirely different from each other, and yet both of them typical of India, both in the li long line of India's great men. It is not so much because of any single virtue, but because of the ensemble that I felt that among the world's great men today, Gandhi and Tagore were supreme as human beings. What good fortune for me to have come in close contact with them. So Nehru, who had the good fortune of knowing these two, spoke about this. So the reason I mention something like this is when in today's world, you know, even Twitter I think is going from 150 characters to a little bit more. I hope uh, it adds wisdom as one central element into that expansion. But the lack of nuance and the lack of ability to judge people in a much more deeper and wider context is becoming lost. And so my plea to all of you, first as master's students in various disciplines, is not to join that race, is to stay away from simple labels. I mean, Bhagat Singh being the latest, and we can again speak about him in Q&A. Bhagat Singh died saying in clubs in the bath. He was first and foremost a socialist, uh, and then everything else, maybe patriot next. Uh, but it's rather interesting that the BJP would adopt Bhagat Singh as one of their, you know, demi-idols uh, at, this, at, at, at this juncture. So the sort of easy adoption of symbols and symbolism without any attention to either the context or uh, the variety and the nuance of each of these. I'll just read you another little piece. Um, and this one is between, say, say, this is Gokhale about Ranade. So these are great men, I mean, just awesomely great men speaking about other great men, right? So. The first thing that struck anyone who came in contact with Ranade as underlying all his mar marvelous pers personality was his fine, fervent, profound patriotism. In another passage, Gokhale says, or we might speak of him as a reformer whose comprehensive gaze ranged over the entire fabric from summit to base. I believe the greatest worker of our time, high praise indeed coming from what you know, one of India's great, great intellectuals. So each of these guys had a very, very good opinion about the other, but today we so easily dismiss them as either not nationalists or simply, you know, people who were uh, there at that moment of history and time. But in my book, the, all of these people represented a liberal view of India upon whose back a lot of eventual Indian uh, independence uh, was 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 um, was finally established. Let me switch a little bit to to contemporary times. I don't know whether many of you have read uh, a fellow called Fukuyama. If you have not, one takeaway should be: please do read um, the books by by Fukuyama. Fukuyama Fukuyama is essentially says that. Dem the democratic, liberal, political system we have today, in some senses, represents the end of history. He might have been quite premature in that observation, but that is his observation, that um, we have reached a point where the end of history has uh, arrived upon us because we have, dis we have identified the perfect political system. Samuel Huntington, who was his professor, 
actually proposes that Fukuyama is quite entirely wrong. And he says essentially that the battle for ideas is a battle for a civilization, civilizational set of ideas, which means that Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism essentially represent what he calls the clash of civilizations. So, you know, this is Fukuyama, whose professor was, uh, was Huntington. So, if, if nothing else, please read those two books as an idea of what might constitute political philosophy and what might be a critique to the political. What Huntington says is that since the French Revolution, we have taken a pause from what is a universal idea of a clash of civilizations. Only for the last 200, 300 years, we now have this notion that we have a liberal, democratic, you can argue free market system of the world, uh, whereas the world is not that way. Now, if you wanted to provide evidence for Huntington's statement from today, it abounds. Uh, so you think of Turkey, for instance. So the Justice Party, which is called the AK Party in Turkey, came to existence in 2002 as a government in power, essentially came on a liberal plank suggesting that they will do many things, including, for instance, join the European Union. And were they to join the European Union, they would abolish, for instance, uh, they would abolish death penalty. That's where the AK Party started. Where the AK Party is, is today is one of the largest uh, prohibitors, banners of Twitter and Facebook. Um, it has become essentially a symbol for the victory of Eastern Turkey over Western Turkey. Uh, it has become a symbol for a very sort of nationalistic, in the wrong sense of the word, nationalistic uh, government in Turkey. So that's one. I'll give you another example, Putin. Putin has ostensibly uh, is in charge of a democratically li liberal republic, except that he has a very unique strategy. He appoints 100% of the candidates in every election at every level in, in Russia. So it's a, what you might call an appointed, uh, uh, elected uh, governance, which obviously defeats the very purpose of basic liberalism uh, entirely and totally. Think completely of a different country, Thailand. What has happened in Thailand is that a democratically elected uh, premier has been thrown out twice on the notion that he is corrupt. Yes, he may be corrupt, but then a liberal government, government system would allow for that corruption to actually be charged and the, the, the uh, the perpetrator of the crime essentially allowed to defend themselves in that context of, 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 of their own judicial system. But that's not the case. The elite have essentially, in a constitutional coup, overthrown an elected government. So if you think a lot of this is just merely old stuff that we are not, uh, that are not relevant to today, uh, you know, think again. I'm not even talking about the context of India. Uh, and the context of India may, some may argue, look a little bit like where Turkey looked in 2002, 2003. Essentially, a, a plank where you come on the idea of good administration and good governance, but then one or the other facets of the, uh, the ideology takes over and liberal traditions are at risk. <coughs> So I, I leave it again to each of you to think about where we are on this notion of uh, liberalism. Now, if you were a nationalist, you might sing the slogans that, that are being asked of you. But if you are a patriot, then you might critique what is happening in such a way that that constructive criticism will return us back to a state where we follow uh, the rule of law, which by definition um, is the constitution, um, constitution of, 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 of this country. Now, all of that brings me to sort of where we are today, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So if you think about all the speeches that are being made, I don't know how many of you listened to Tarur's speech after, uh, after the, uh, the latest incidents, the one in which he got 
uh, snagged on the aside. Uh, so that is one idea of India. It's an idea of India that suggests that India is plural, tolerant, uh, very liberal in its tradition, and very rule bound, and the rule is provided by the constitution of the country. And everything else, the idea that you might not do this or not do that represents a threat to that, that view of the world. Yeah? The nationalists argue that you shouldn't be allowed to make these remarks. These are not reflective <coughs> of a responsible citizen. Whether or not they are legal or not is a separate issue. Whether law covers specifically and maybe uh, uh, we can get our law professors to tell us whether, whether law addresses that specifically or not. The way we interpret the sedition laws are very specifically focused. The precedent has all been towards action rather than words. Should it or should it not, we can discuss again in the Q&A. But the nationalists would say, even the words are harmful enough. Why are we not making that uh, unconstitutional slash uh, illegal? Currently, it is not. But should we make it unconstitutional and, and illegal? So that is the context upon which we come to a time like today where we are discussing this word of both liberalism and nationalism. I would, I'm not going to give you too many answers. We can talk about it in Q&A a little bit. But I would like you to think about each of these individuals. Think about a Gokhale, a Rana Day, a Gandhi, a Tagore, a Voltaire, a Rousseau, if you wish, characters from the Jataka tales. And think about where they might be on that axis of liberalism and of, of patriotism. I think, for instance, a Gokhale, a certainly a Rana Day, could be put high on both the liberalism score and high on the patriotism score as well. Uh, and therefore, it is a false trade-off to think about saying you are one or the other, not both. Um, and that trade-off does not need to be made um, at all. And I think for, for the defense of a constitutional republic, and for the defense of a modern day nation state, uh, you actually need both. Uh, you, need, you need patriots who will both in the sense of the, of the sword and the pen defend the values, the ideas, and the territory of the country. And you need people to defend the idea that everybody, particularly those uh, who don't have the automatic advantage of education or birth, uh, the ovarian lottery, as it were, um, are also allowed, and, and many of you, I think, in APU are beneficiaries of, of that latter idea. Just a moment on equality before I close. For instance, the, the US Constitution, I don't know how many of you have read it, uh, has very beautiful words. So the preamble to the US Constitution has very, very beautiful words that essentially describe this equality and fraternity of all man. But the US Constitution did not guarantee even the right of a woman to vote for, I don't know, 150 years after it was first promulgated. Uh, so something as elementary, 50% of the population as that. Uh, as you know, many of you might have seen, see, seen the movie, the United Kingdom suffragette uh, movement took place, I think, in the early 1900s. And the full right of women to vote in, uh, in the UK was only granted in 1928, I think. So, uh, so think as a specific example, Jodhira Phule and Ramohan Roy and Ranade and others were arguing for the equality of women ah, 75 to 100 years before it was given as a voting right to women in the United Kingdom, leave alone anywhere else. So you might think that the Age of Enlightenment came in the 17th or 18th century. It did not come well into the 20th century as far as women were concerned. Take a different topic, slavery. The Gettysburg Address by Lincoln, which was more than a, almost 100 years, four score and seven years after the promulgation of US independence, was essentially about the granting of, of freedom to slaves in the United States well into the 18, I think it was 1875 or 1865, 1870, something like that. So 100 years after, uh, after it was sort of we men are created equal, uh, sure, except slaves were not defined as men certainly women who are not defined as men. So, uh, so all of that takes a while. I mean, as you know, the United States even again uh, has not had a single woman president. Maybe we're going to change that this time, who knows. But, uh, but 
even that equality hasn't gone to all sections of society. So equality as a liberal principle has been less effective. The equality of opportunity in particular has been less effective in its implementation. So modern liberalism uh, propounded by a guy called John Rawls in the United States essentially takes this idea, the idea that classical liberalism essentially converted the oppression of church and state into the oppression of the educated and the elite um, must allow for greater and much more great, much greater inclusiveness. So the entire inclusiveness debate in India you might think of today as essentially a social liberal uh, context uh, and that is far, far from being, uh, from, from, from being complete. So let me end there and we can talk about today, topics from yesterday. Do you want to do the yeah. moderation? While you're thinking, I'm just thinking of reading to you. So why, why don't you think of some questions? I'm going to read you a little piece and then you can tell me if you know where it is from. Nationality as a quality is the sentiment permanently present in and giving a sense of distinctive unity to the majority of the members of a particular section of humanity which while at the same time objectively constitutes a distinct group by virtue of possessing certain collective attributes such as homeland, language, religion, history, culture, or tradition. Any guesses as to where that is from? Anyway, that is from a book called We Are Nationhood Defined by M.S. Golwalkar of the RSS. As you might well expect. So, uh, so nationalism has this very virulent, belligerent, aggressive uh, notion to it. The idea that I will defend my country no matter what it does, as opposed to I will defend my country for what it means and does. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Narayan. Uh, questions, comments? Please, first you. Just a small thing, when you started talking about Gandhi, uh, immediately reason came up, uh, as it usually does, but it hadn't come up before. And I, I just wanted to see your thoughts on the relationship between reason and liberalism, and nationalism, of course. Uh, is, it, is reason somehow an integral part of the liberal vision? Um, and if so, is reason part of other visions that are not liberal, and, and so forth? Should we just yeah. question? Okay. Uh, but may, they may be so different one from the uh, uh, one from the other. So I mean, maybe I can answer okay, that. Sure. We have a little time, right? And we have 15, 20 minutes at least. So. Yeah, perfect. So we got in, we got enough time. So we can go one at a time. So so I, 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 you may have missed it. I, I meant to say, and if I didn't, uh, I stand corrected. That reason is one of those threads that is woven into liberalism through the ages. So even in Buddhism. If you think about Buddhism and, and Hinduism, the two sort of words that might be applicable to that and to the Age of Enlightenment would be morality and reason. So it is, so John Locke in fact actually used a term for this, he called it tabula rasa, which literally means a, a blank slate. And, and the idea of that is essentially that a man can write on his own korakagas, if you will, his own idea of what constitutes human values in humanity. And it is not preordained in any sense of the term. So reason is a very, very critical component of liberalism. And the attack against Gandhi, or the question mark on where you would plot him on this ordinal axis, on the liberal axis, comes from whenever he suspends reason for what might be considered either tactical or madcap goals, and both are applicable to Gandhi. 
uh, some are really just eccentric, inexplicable sort of uh, uh, goals, and others are, you know, tactical. So he concedes, you know, he withdraws certain things. So, for instance, I don't know uh, whether you followed uh, prior to the Bhagat Singh uh, events, the Chauri Chaura incident in, uh, in, in North India, Gandhi actually withdrew the non-cooperation movement at that time because there was uh, a group of people that actually attacked the police station. There was mob violence. And because in his view, that was so much higher, the entire pantheon, from left to right, was against the idea. So now Gandhi did it individually without consulting the Congress Consultative Committee. He actually did it by himself. And part of the reason why uh, Bhagat Singh and others fell out with Gandhi was this unilateral imposition of uh, a withdrawal from non-cooperation uh, because everybody was in non-cooperation and the idols of the Bhagat Singhs was Lala Lajpat Rai and Lala Lajpat Rai in particular was protesting through a non-cooperative idea what the Simon Commission was in India at that time. So it was very very clear that uh, the Gandhi was sort of a yo-yoing on the liberal spectrum uh, to someone like Tagore who arguably was 100 or beyond on the liberal scale. He was truly a humanist. He was a universalist. Um, he was a poet. He was a liter lit literator. He was not a politician. So he didn't feel the need to be bound by things of, that might be considered sort of very day-to-day. Uh, -day. And therefore, Gandhi, uh, Tagore was always, there were a lot of similarities, by the way. So whenever Gandhi showed a liberal stripe, that would very likely match the stripe of Gokhale. By the way, of all the people in the, in the freedom movement from, pick a number, 1825 to 1947, Gandhi's true mentor was only Gokhale. You might have thought that Gandhi's true mentor would only have been Tilak, but it is not true. It is actually not true. Gandhi and Tilak did not intersect on the idea of ideas. Gandhi and Tilak intersected on this idea that you had to make the movement for independence an emotional one. And you made it an emotional one by, again, taking it out of the elite into, by the way, there's an excellent speech by uh, Jinnah, by Ambedkar, by Ambedkar on Jinnah, Ranade, and Gandhi. And Jinnah, it's available in, in the public domain on the internet. Please take a look if you can. And, and uh, Ambedkar examines the question of which of these three guys was a great man. Just an absolutely, I think, one of the best political writings in, in recent times. So. Um, and, and so it is this notion of reason that separates, I think, Gok uh, Tilak and uh, Gandhi from the rest. Tagore as being one extreme expression of it, but even others such as Gokhale and Firosha Mehta. And Annie Besant question mark. <laughs> we can talk about her too if you like. Yeah. Sorry, here we can ask a question. Go ahead. Well, I think uh, my first question you've already answered in part. I was about to ask you, how do you call Tagore a nationalist? Because from whatever I have read of Tagore, I understand that he was dismayed by the idea of a nation instead itself and how, it, how bounding it was, how binding it was. Um, second question was, in, you only spoke of it very briefly, but a certain strand of liberal intellectuals are of the view that slogans, no matter of what nature uttered, uh, cannot be punishable in reference to what's happening in JNU. But isn't the pen mightier than the sword? They say that only violence should be and can be punishable. So what are your views on that? Okay, on the second question, I'm going to ask you to help. On, on law as it relates to... I actually had questions. Okay, yeah, questions, but you can give one answer and then ask the question. So can you help us on the second one and then we'll get back to the first one. You may need to identify yourself to the rest yes. of you. 
So, um, sorry, I'm, I, I just wanted to say that um, I don't know if it's a legal question um, on whether uh, there needs to be actual violence um, for sedition law. No? Uh, but if it's a legal question, I think the position you took is clear, and that's, that's where the law is. You can say what you want. You can, at least it's not sedition. It might be other forms of uh, offenses, but not sedition. Um, but I don't know whether that was what you had in mind. Um, sure. But I'll let you go for that because I have other questions. Okay. So, so, so just again, you have to think about the context of these things, right? The context of all of this is that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so if you must err in any direction, you must err in the direction that the government should have less power than more. Because the government is not one benevolent, certainly cannot guarantee, be guaranteed to be benevolent in the future. And so the natural right of man must trump the right of government to continually legislate against freedom. So my own personal position is that the minimal right granted to the sovereign is that which guarantees all of our freedoms, but not an ounce more. And so I fully actually support the idea that only if there is very tangible, specific, actionable uh, uh, idea must it be prosecuted. Uh, mere words should should first be allowed, uh, because in many instances, you know, what Gandhi himself said, an unjust law is no law. So how do we know a law is unjust, right? Uh, you know a law is unjust by allowing it to be spoken about, 377, for instance, right? By the way, we haven't spoken about that at all in equality, right? In countries today, even, even the U UN Human Rights Commission gives you the equality of race, sex, creed, uh, you know, all of that stuff but doesn't give you the right of sexual orientation, uh, partly because the United States has veto power on, on what uh, some of these things get written. But so, so there's lots of instances where it's excluded. So I would actually err on the side, but that's the debate. You know, Again, we had an incident in Brussels yesterday, right? You know, when you have the, by the way, uh, the, the, the United States version of pursuit of happiness is replaced by security of self in the UN Charter of uh, Human Rights. And the question is, for the protection of security of self, what level of rights would you trade? And that's literally what has come to be in the context of today's uh, debate on terrorism, right? So, so all the debates in India about Tada and about Kafe Posa and about uh, but it doesn't even have to be only uh, draconian laws related to personal security. Uh, the FCRA, I don't know how many of you are financial students here, but FCRA 2010 is a rule that uh, Putin would have been proud of. I mean, it is draconian to the extreme. Uh, and it can, you know, you can do all manner of things using FCRA 2010, which is a foreign, uh, foreign exchange regulation that was first instituted at the time of Indira Gandhi's emergency, but then continued and recast in 2010 as, in, in my view, one of India's worst laws ever. Uh, so it doesn't even simply have to be in the, in the realm of security and national security. It could even be in the realm of finance and everyday taxes, uh, you know, stuff like that. Please. Yeah. So, uh, um, I had two separate points. I think the idea of trying to recover uh, Indian liberal tradition is an important one. But I was curious why we need to look to classical antiquity to do that. So your, your presentation seemed to have two parts. One where you look to early Buddhism and uh, Vedic materials. And then where you look to early modern materials. And I, I'm just curious, why the two strategies, and um, and what is it that we what is the purchase that we get on the idea of being liberal by pushing that that far down? 
That's my first. That far back, you mean? That far back, yeah. The second um, um, idea that I want to explore is uh, the connection between liberalism and nationalism. It seemed that um, e even in the way you presented it, uh, though you didn't say as much, that the constitution or constitutionalism acts as a hedge against both. It hedges liberalism from the idea that uh, liberal freedoms are absolute and it hedges against um, nationalism with an idea that somehow any pursuit of any collective political identity is, is an absolute value. So I, I, I like the fact that you uh, concluded, um, or towards your conclusion, you, you mentioned that defending a constitutional tradition is really important in this context. But I, it seemed to me that it actually does more work in the, in, in the way you're developing the idea. It actually sits between liberalism and nationalism uh, in an interesting way. Okay. Yeah, this, the second question first. I, I, I don't think of it, so, so if I paraphrase you correctly, you, you're, you're suggesting that somehow a constitution knocks down the extreme of these two axes, axes into a box that is more acceptable. I, I, I don't quite see it that way. I, I, I would rather think of it as a constitution as an umbrella that both virtually and metaphorically protects both those axes rather than physically constraints those, those axes. So I think it is the intellectual foundation and the intellectual and the rule book by which both those axes are defendable. That's the way I, I think of it. So that's, that's on your second question. Your first question, just the thread. Why, why antiquity? Maybe I, I should wear my saffron robe proudly now. Uh, <laughs> intellectual thought, if, if you think that reason, morality, philosophy, political philosophy, renaissance, all constitute an important element of this notion of liberalism, then you might argue and, and, and particularly if you want to take it out of the religious context, then you might argue that, that we have no choice. The, uh, the, even Shankara in 8th century, while he might have been intellectually uh, sharp and very precise in his argument, was quite religious in the way he presented them. So if you must take religion out of the discussion, then you have to even exclude Shankara. But if you didn't have to take religion, then you might accept elements of what Shankara said. But what Shankara said was, in effect, an address on all the non-reform aspects of Hinduism, which was what Buddhism had been built upon for about a thousand years before that. So as Professor Iyengar said, one of the things I do is, uh, is uh, uh, a little public policy institution called Takshashila. Takshashila is at the center of not only Indo-Greek philosophy that goes back 2,000 years, this is the Takshashila in Pakistan, but also Buddhist philosophy. And in fact, we had the Tibetan prime minister come down and he basically was talking almost entirely about Takshashila because the philosophy of Tibet essentially draws upon all the philosophy that was uh, what was propounded in Takshashila in the, let's say, 300 BC kind of time frame, all the way up to, I don't know, 800 AD, 700 AD. After that, and this is the real question mark, right? If Ashutosh Vashni were here, he would ask the question, let's debate Baroso Salki Gulami. Whether that is Baroso Salki Gulami or not, I, we can discuss separately. But it is certainly a suspension of intellectual, philosophical, liberal growth for about a thousand years. So Indian, to me, Indian dark ages in that sense 
goes from, I don't know, 700, 800 AD all the way to maybe at best early 19th century. It's a long time. I don't, I don't know whether you agree with that. I mean, there were other movements in the middle, but they were all so deeply religious. So the Bhakti movement, for instance, what Madhava spoke about, you know, uh, duality versus singularity, you know, that. If you had to pursue a long one, what would be the tradition? The tradition was interrupted, I think. And so, but even, so, so let's, so don't accept my point of view. Why did Ramon Roy or Ranade or Gokhale also go back to antiquity? They were certainly closer to the Middle Ages than we are. Yeah, maybe Chandan has the answer. <laughs> the Brits wouldn't have taken Raja Ramon Roy seriously otherwise. They were convinced that the Vedas, that age was the touchstone of Indian civilization. He had to appeal to that authority. This is not, may seem but simple, but it's give true. Give me a practical answer, but let's, let, so let's say he didn't do that. Mm -hmm. what, what's his universe? What, what could he have done? He didn't do it, but what could he have done? He was a trained Persian scholar. Sorry? Raja Ramon was a Persian scholar as well. He knew the Persian traditions. Sure. But by the way, there's a lot of commonality between antiquity in Vedic and the Avastajan antiquity. Yeah. But none, none since, as far as I can tell. Yeah? No, Narad, even if you did a simple sociology of Mughal rule, if that's the moment of interruption, I mean, it didn't extend to what we now consider to be India. Large parts of South India were outside of the influence of Mughal rule, and the Bhakti movement flourished. And whether you want to call it religious or not is a controversial question. I mean, everyone is talking about devotion, but is it religious the way we understand it now is a different Sorry, question. Okay. Maybe, I think it is, but it doesn't have any relevance to the, this notion of liberalism. That's what I'm saying. You no. can say it had a separate intellectual power of its own. We can debate. No, but I, 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 I like the idea of revisiting the past to recover ideas of the individual, which may not have much to do with liberalism directly. Because what the British did was to say, you, you never had individuals here. You only had communities, we had individuals. And everyone believed that at that time. But we had individualism even here, but of very different kinds, rooted in different metaphysics of who an individual was. And most certainly it wasn't liberal because the idea of that all individuals had the same rights was absent. So in that way, to insist on a genealogy of liberalism by looking at it as an individual, may, there may be a slippage there, I feel. That has to be explored a bit more. I think it has to be explored a bit more. Yeah. Good topic for some PhDs, etc. But as I said, I would apply the, the label liberalism very carefully to antiquity, in Indian antiquity. But I would be more open to investigating social contract theory. Sorry, yeah, sorry I think. that distinction you're making? So Just as you started, uh, right, saying that liberal ideas of freedom, you, you started with law uh, and others. It's a, it's, a, it's a intellectual tradition about thinking about the problem of freedom in a particular way. And there are many other ways of thinking about the problem of freedom. And so that's why I asked, clearly a Ramon Roy and Ranade onwards, the, the links to a liberal way of thinking about freedom are tighter. Early modern Indian thinking on freedom is very tightly linked to European liberal tradition. Do they use the same books? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, but when we push back, do we need to say liberal freedom? That was all my question. We might, we might still say interesting philosophical inquiry of freedom. Read it for that sake. Yeah. So, for a moment, if I take the word liberalism with a small L rather than a capital L. That, that's the point I'm trying to make. 
that that if you draw the threads from antiquity, and certainly Greek antiquity is one of them as well, if you draw the threads from antiquity, this notion that individual morality and reason form one part of the thread could be extended back, right, with a small L. If you define liberalism as that tradition which was born in the age of enlightenment, then tautologically it cannot apply backwards, right. But I am just saying with a small L, if you think of the idea that says, I think therefore I am. I think therefore I can write my own history and I think therefore the greater good of the greater many, which is basically a utilitarian principle translated as Sarve Janan Sukhino Bhavantu, then you have a much easier way of going backwards. But if you give it a very specific semantic label like I did for the word nationalism, then, then of course you can't take it backwards. So, I tend to agree with you where the label has always been you guys only know society and samaj and community, you don't know individualism is actually untrue if you take it back to the Vedic ages. But if you, you can then expound that further and say you guys know nothing about how to coexist with each other for maximum benefit of a community, then you can say hey that's, that's not true either. The idea of dharma is exactly that. Of course it was you know, there are other rigidities in the structure that eventually, for instance, uh, Buddha was, was trying to deal with. But uh, everything becomes, so classic liberalism itself was a failure in a way, right? John Rawls essentially wrote because women were not given the right to vote, equality was not there, slavery still persisted, etc., etc. So I, I'm thinking about the small L rather than the big L uh, of liberalism. But point taken, we can pick it up and off. I'm trying to contrast it. Okay, so I'm saying I'm a patriot, sorry, just to clarify, a patriot is what a country he stands for, believes in what a country stands for and does, whereas a nationalist is one who defends a, uh, uh, a country no matter what, no matter what it does. So other way around, other way around. So, so the difference is, is um, that's just one one quote. But the idea is that you celebrate. So it's it's it's. How am I, what metaphor could I use? The idea is, you want constructive critique for the identity, for your identity with your nation, in such a way that its basic principles will be defended, and it will improve over time. That's a patriot. But as a nationalist is just saying, you know, it's jingoism. It's just, no matter what it is, this is me. So I'll give you a very simple, it's not directly pertinent to this, but indirectly. You know, people in India, the Indian press was all over the map on this guy called Bobby Jindal being, becoming governor of Louisiana. You know, simply on the jingoistic notion that he's of Indian origin, therefore celebrate. If you know what Bobby Jindal stands for, you'd think, hundred times before you supported Bobby Jindal, perhaps. You may still support him, but my point is you have, you'd have to know what he is before you start supposed, supporting him simply on this notion that he is of Indian origin. So the jingoistic version is the quick, you know, tatkal acceptance of someone as my tribe and therefore fantastic. So a true patriot wouldn't support Bobby Jindal? A true patriot would understand what he is before he supports him. But a nationalist would blindly? Exactly. The, the words don't directly apply, but the, the idea is. So, uh, taking the same uh, small L liberal idea, uh, where will you put the Chanakya here? Like, Chanakya is the one known to be uh, like high on nationalist, I don't know, like patriotic nationalist views. Yeah, very and complex. Chanakya was actually uh, not a historical figure who is not that much written about. So, actually, one doesn't have too much, other than the book itself, you don't have too much history about who and what. Shanakya was, so it's actually very difficult to to say where exactly he might have been on the spectrum. Uh, the debate may be different. Was Chanakya India's Machiavelli is a different question. 
uh, and, and he might well have been. So if you wanted a book of governance and uh, political savvy uh, existence, then you might read Sun Tzu in China, uh, Machiavelli in Europe, and uh, Chanakya in India. I don't know whether, I don't know enough. Honestly, I don't think there is original material on Chanakya. Right. Uh, Two plays. Yeah. Very, it's, uh, I've not read an authentic account of his life. I've read the book, it's, I mean, or translations of the book. Like people say he was the, one of the first ones to have the idea of uh, like bigger nation than the small state, so like, uh, on the Yeah, it's really governance. So I think the, to use modern language, he was more concerned with Sarkar than Samaj. <laughs> so last question maybe. So uh, recently I had a like, debate with a friend and so that was regarding, so you to, uh, talked about uh, Gokhale, Ranade, Gandhi and uh, so they were libertarian and nationalists. Not, not libertarian, liberal. Liberal and so uh, my knowledge of politics is okay. little rusty but right. yeah so liberal and nationalist and uh, today's uh, liberals they want, so they, are, they would contest that they were nationalists because they uh, existed in a colonial era. And now uh, uh, they contend that India itself after coloni colonialism had become imperial. And uh, so uh, the issue of Kashmir or uh, issue of uh, uh, Afspa in Assam or annex annexion of uh, Hyderabad. So there was a referendum in Hyderabad but not in JNK. So uh, and they want, uh, so the other question, uh, other thing is, uh, the liberal thought exists within a boundary, uh, within a polity, but they want to extend beyond that. So, uh, like, uh, we, we will protect liberty within, so America will wage war in Afghanistan or uh, Iraq to protect their, uh, li uh, pr to protect liberty fraternity in America. So, uh, so though, like, my friend would want liberty to extend, like, to really mean what it is. So how would you respond to this uh, liberty and uh, nationalism? Yeah. Uh, so you're right that the cultural imperialism of liberalism on others, so imposition of liberalism on others is against the spirit of liberalism itself. So America is not actually a model liberal country at all because it is actually a country that not only celebrates some liberal values, but is mixed up with ideas of God and country. U Europe would be far more the center of this capital L liberalism than America would. And, um, and, and so that's where you'd have to explore in order to defend national interest, what is the bare minimum you would have to do, right? So that happened in the first Iraq war, for instance, where they pushed back Saddam Hussein from Kuwait and then withdrew rather than go further. So that might have been this trade-off between extreme version of exporting freedom and uh, the idea of freedom versus a basic guarantee of our own freedom relative to, uh, to somebody impacting up upon it, if you see the difference. So in fact, that was the big criticism of the second Bush that under an idea that some of you may know called neoliberals, neoconservatives, neo neoconservatives, neocon, he actually went further and invaded Iraq and stayed there rather than withdraw at the moment that it was the right moment to withdraw from. So I think you can definitely argue by both moral and political philosophy that America overextended its brief, uh, for instance in Iraq, um, by trying to export its idea of the world <laughs> to parts where it had no sovereign right to, uh, to, to, to expand it. Beyond that, I, what I'm trying to tell all of you is the word liberal itself means being open to being persuaded, which means you have to be open. If you're closed, if, if there's only one phrase that will, is the litmus test of whether you will be uh, in or not in the new dispensation, 
That is the exact opposite of being, being liberal. You should be open to being persuaded. You should be transparent about your views and, and in discussion. And the point of reading all of these things was to tell you that people who were from different persuasions. So as you know, Ambedkar was not of the same party as the Congress. But the Congress was a very wide tent. So Ambedkar became not only the drafter of the constitution, but held very senior posts in the, uh, in the, in the um, government in the early days. So it is that notion, the notion that even if you have different views, you can transparently express it and we can discuss. That, that thread is getting lost in today's India where you take hard, unthought out positions and then you defend them in a jingoistic, uh, nationalistic manner. Uh, I mean, even Bhagat Singh, I mean, if BJP thought about it, I don't think they will, I mean, Bhagat Singh is so not BJP that I don't see how they can adopt him. Other than for the positive halo that movies have created. You know, Bhagat Singh was, as I told you, he was atheist, communist, revolutionary, violent, patriot. All words operative. And except for patriot, the other words have nothing in the BJP lexicon. So why would you adopt him? Instead of that, why don't you just say, we like the patriotic idea. Why do you want to personify somebody? So, right, which is, by the way, and maybe I shouldn't say this with the camera on, which is why somebody else like Sashi Tharoor can claim that, you know, the socialist atheist part was actually common to other people that we know in current context. Right? So, I mean, that way if you unpack a lot of these ideas, I think this simple... Uh, adoption of people and caricatures of ideas is not correct. I mean, uh, I don't know how many, uh, do you teach about Ranade at all? So, uh, Ranade is just forgotten, right? I mean, he, he doesn't, he deserves to be so totally forgotten. Right? He was a polymath, he was a brilliant man, his writings were good, he was an economist, uh, scientist, I mean, Many of these guys were polymath. They were good in multiple subjects. As you say, Raja Ramon Roy knew Persian and Sanskrit. Half from father, half from mother. Uh, many languages after that. He actually ended up learning several languages after that. So these guys were all outstanding in whatever they did. They were human beings, so they had packages and contradictions. But read those packages, read those contradictions, and take what's good from them and make it into what is today, rather than caricaturizing them and just picking up, you know, I like this, I don't like that. Uh, Nehru, I mean, how, I don't know how they discuss Nehru in the way they discuss Nehru today. Uh, you know, Gandhi is still untouchable, which might be a strange position for him to be in. <laughs> so, uh, on that note, I guess, um, so I, I only in the interest of time and so on, I'll just sort of say uh, thank you, Mr. Ramachandran, for sort of... Uh, for this uh, thing and uh, thank you all.